Hi cadets, Dr. Boyce here. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the pieces that uh, were touched upon um, during lesson three, but I realized that um, you might need a little bit more information. Uh, so the two things that I'm going to talk about right now are sort of the whole concept of research ethics um, and then I'm going to talk to you about um, some common measures of psychological research um, because I realized that in the last class we kind of didn't have enough time to go through it. So the first thing is um, ethics. Okay, so when you're conducting a research study um, it is important for the participant to know exactly what they're doing. Um, what are the activities? What is the potential risks and benefits? Um, who to go to if they have questions? Um, and you need to usually verify that they understand, you know, these benefits, these risks, these procedures that they're going to undergo. So you create an informed consent document um, such that uh, you have them either sign it or if it's online, there'll be a checkbox that says, I agree. Um, and you as the researcher keep that um, so that if anybody questions, well, was the participant adequately aware of what they were gonna be doing? Um, you know, you have that as your record. Okay. So respect for persons. Um, so respect for persons basically means that um, you are safeguarding um, the dignity of your participants. Um, this especially comes into play when you are dealing with uh, children. Um, you, it's a way to minimize um, things like coercion or people feeling like they have to participate or um, just making sure that the person feels like they have the capability to make their own decisions um, and that the person always feels respected and um, dignified. So that's something that you want to think about as you're going through research studies or if you're participating in a research study. Um, there's going to be precautions to make sure that you feel you're respected. Beneficence. Um, so some of you asked me about this one. Um, so I wanted to at least go a little bit more into it. Um, so in a study, you want to make sure that um, the cost to a participant does not outweigh um, the benefit. Um, specifically, you want to make sure that um, you do no harm to the participant. Um, for example, you know, you're not gonna, it is not ethical to subject somebody through a large amount of stress um, if there's not going to be, you know, an equal um, or greater than, I guess I should say, benefit toward going through this particular treatment. The bottom line is you want to minimize risk. You want to minimize the negative effects of your experiment or of your experimental intervention. And you want to maximize the benefit uh, as much as you can um, for the participant. Um, it's always with the participant's best interest in mind. And this ties into the next point, which is uh, privacy and confidentiality. So it's very, very important that you keep whatever data you get um, confidential. Uh, this ensures that, you know, their identities are not connected uh, with results or they can't be identified uh, based on their data um, when you're like 
reporting out your findings. Um, this is very important when you have a very specific or small population uh, because it is possible if you have enough pieces of information um, that you could trace it back and figure out who that person was. Um, which, in no matter what the situation is, that's never good. Um, so, um, the last piece was justice, right? So, if you're going to have a benefit, um, and you're going to have cost, um, it should be equitable across all the participants. Um, you should try to make sure that, you know, no one group is going to receive a lot more benefit than another group. So an example of this is, let's say I use the tools like Connect to augment instruction. And I only offered Connect to one group. Um, and then I didn't offer Connect to the other group. That's not very equitable because the Connect group has an unfair advantage. Um, so what you would do in that case is you would make sure that if you're testing Connect, that you would have an equitable intervention for the non-connect group such that they can still receive the benefit of participating in that study. Um, question is, does deception have a role here? Um, you can do some deception research, um, but the, um, the key with deception is that it needs to maintain that there is still greater greater benefit for the participant. In other words, it doesn't place the participant at an additional risk. And also, um, deception is only used uh, usually when, um, if they knew what condition they were in, um, it would influence their responses. Um, so generally speaking, it all comes back to the welfare of the participant. Do, are they are they still getting the maximum benefit and the maximum protection possible? Um, and that's what I would advise you um, is if you're trying to understand, you know, are you doing the ethically right thing? Um, it's important to always err on the side of additional protection always be conservative um, because the end goal is you want to make sure that a participant feels safe, a participant feels respected, and a participant clearly understands what they're going to do with respect to research. So that's just a little bit extra on um, the ethical piece, which I believe was PO3-9. Um, so the other thing that I didn't get to talk a whole lot about in class and I realized that I burned through it, um, was the concept of psychological measures. Um, this is actually a personal interest of mine. Um, I am a metrics person uh, as it comes to my team that I work with. Um, and generally what I like to do is I like to look at all different types of measures. So let's, let's talk about the measures, right? Um, so, self-reports. Um, these are, you know, participants' written or oral responses, um, and it's often in the form of interviews or questionnaires. You know, how did you feel about this latest movie, right? Did you like it? Did you not? Scale one to five. Um. Uh, the problem with these is that um, you are making the assumption that the that the person has an accurate understanding into um, what they thought um, and that they're going to be unbiased. Okay, a lot of times you'll run into what is known as social desirability bias, where they will give you the answer that they want, right? Um, and oftentimes, like for example, 
my research involves augmented reality sand tables, right? And you'll say, you know, did this, did this effect help you? Did this system help you? And they're, they say yes, a lot. Um, but you have to be careful here because they may think that it helped them. But when you actually assess them, they don't um, demonstrate that increased performance. So just because somebody likes something, it might be because it's novel or new or fancy or shiny and not necessarily an indication of uh, improved performance. So that's when you get to behavioral measures. So behavioral measures um, look at how somebody's performing objectively, um, either in natural settings or in the lab. So taken from, you know, a research study that I worked on, um, a lot of times what that will, what we will do is we will look at, okay, correct or incorrect in terms of a specific type of question. So my study was uh, military tactics knowledge. Um, well, did they get the answer right or not? Um, and how fast did they get the answer right? You know, did, did, did the group with intervention A perform faster and more accurately than the group with intervention B? Um, the thing is, um, a lot of times you'll see this in small scale studies, um, you know, um, but it's important to understand that these are harder to build um, and it takes time to figure out, okay, what is the correct answer? What is a different, what is an incorrect answer? How do we code these appropriately? Um, and in addition, the participants may start to what is known as game the system or modify their behavior because they're figuring out a pattern um, based on, you know, your data or the intervention in front of them. Uh, physiological measures. So physiological measures um, focus on bodily responses. Um, some of these include um, electrodermal activity, which is um, skin conductance coming off your hand, um, heart rate, um, respiration rate, oxygen level, um, blood volume, um, electrical signals coming off the brain. Um, so these are often trying to understand what is the physiology changes as you introduce a certain variable of interest. Um, so, um, this is usually very sp specialized equipment. Um, and it, it, it's not easy to collect data, right? And then once you collect that data, well, what does it really mean? Um, and I'll give you an example from my research. So let's say I'm measuring uh, skin conductance off of somebody's wrist dealing with a simulation system, right? So a, a spike or a, a skin conductance response could be from um, increased stress or it could be increased excitement. So that's a positive or a negative thing. So depending on how a person views it, um, that interpretation could be different. Additionally, it could have something to do with environmental effects. Um, so skin conductance rate is um, triggered oftentimes by ambient room temperature. So if a cadet has a heavy coat on under the sensor, well then the sensor itself might not be getting accurate measures. Um, so generally speaking, when it comes to measures, um, measures are always best when you're combining different types of measures to really try to get at what is going on with your participant. The key is trying to figure out how do I take these different measures, use them effectively, and be able to make those cause and effect relationships based on previous research?